Good morning, everyone. So before I begin, I want to take a moment to say thank you to Mike Parsons and everyone at his, on his team at Abutment Direct for organizing this webinar today. And I'd also like to take this opportunity to introduce a new company by Abutment Direct called Dentology. Obviously, Abutment Direct sells a lot more than just abutments now. Uh, they've got 3D printers, resins, zirconia, burrs, alloys, you name it. So they wanted a name to reflect that. Moving forward, all non-implant components will now be sold by Dentology. As you saw from the animation there, the name is a portmanteau of the words dental and technology, which I think is very fitting and clever. So thank you to the team at Dentology for putting on this present today, presentation today. So what we're going to be presenting today is an introduction to 3D printing. Uh, so we're going to start with the absolute fundamentals and go from there to help you build a better understanding of 3D printing and how it relates to the dental field. Uh, just a bit of housekeeping before the uh, presentation. This is a webinar format presentation today. So that means video and audio for attendees is disabled and chat functionality has been turned off as well. Uh, I'll be taking questions through the Q&A feature that you can find at the bottom of your screen, and I'll try my best to address those questions at the end of the presentation. So once again, thank you for joining us today, and let's get started. So a little bit about myself. I'm a second generation dental technician, and in my spare time, I run a blog called Dental Tech Tips, where we focus on tips, tricks, and all the latest and greatest in the dental industry. And if you'd like to connect with me online or through social media, you can find me in all the usual places with the username at Dental Tech Tips. So the first question we need to ask, of course, is what is 3D printing? Well, let's take a step backwards and uh, look at traditional two-dimensional printing. Everyone knows what this is, I hope. Uh, it's a regular paper printer that you connect to your computer. And I sincerely hope that everyone knows how it works, but just in case you don't, you have either a document or a photo on your computer that sent, that's sent to your printer and it uses either ink or toner to produce a letter or photograph. So this printer works by depositing ink or toner in a flat two-dimensional layer. And at the end result is a physical real-world representation on paper of what you had created on your computer. Now, suppose for a minute that I printed a pattern on multiple sheets of paper. I cut that pattern out with some scissors and stacked them on top of each other uh, with some glue. Eventually, I'd start seeing some uh, vertical dimension in my stack of papers. And if I was talented enough, the result could look something like this. So what you're seeing here is a paper sculpture made to look like a marble statue by an artist named Lee Hongbo. Super neat and I'd highly recommend that you check out his work if you've never seen it before. But getting back to my point, if you stacked enough sheets of paper on top of each other, you've started building a three-dimensional object. And at its most fundamental core, 3D printing works on this exact principle. So once again, you have either a digital impression or restoration that you've designed on your computer and the 3D printer uses filament or resin to produce a real physical dental restoration or appliance. Digital models are simply transformed into real physical objects one layer at a time until you have a physical real world three dimensional representation of what you had created on your computer. So a brief history of 3D printing. When it was introduced back in the 1980s, it was referred to as rapid prototyping. Before 3D printing, if you wanted a prototype, you would need to design your parts on a linear CAD program, send those CAD designs off to a machine shop for tooling, uh, to create molds for injection molded plastic, and in about two to three months, the shop would send you a rough prototype from the mold that hadn't been polished yet. And things more than likely wouldn't fit together, but it would give you an idea of what you'd be working with. Rapid prototyping changed the game completely because parts could be fabricated on demand and pretty much exactly to specification. Nowadays, the uses for 3D printing have become far more diverse, of course, uh, hobbyists, education, research, manufacturing, and of course, in my opinion, the most important, dental. 3D printing wouldn't be possible without the advent of digital dentistry. Digital is kind of a buzzword for any kind of new and exciting technology in dentistry. 
But at its core, the invention of CAD CAM for use in dentistry and the use of digital computer controlled technologies versus simple mechanical or electrical tools has been absolutely revolutionary. Digital manufacturing pathways in dentistry can be broadly classified into two categories, additive and subtractive. A subtractive manufacturing process involves an object that is larger than the desired end product and excess is removed from it, like a sculptor chipping away at a block of marble. An additive manufacturing process would be like our friend Lee earlier, who takes raw material and binds it together to make his paper statues. When you think of subtractive manufacturing in dentistry, milling, of course, is what comes to mind. We're not gonna go into too much detail. It's a segment of our industry that's matured quite a bit. Uh, when I first started my career about 15 years ago, every single trade show you went to and every single booth had a milling machine and every company was selling their own brand of zirconia, it seemed like. And it's still the most reliable way to produce digital restorations, but there are limitations. Uh, with milling, you have to consider your tool geometry and factor in uh, to your process. So um, there are limitations to what your designs can look like. Things like undercuts, blank height, uh, positioning uh, are a few things that um, are drawbacks for milling. The new kit on the block is of course printing. And now if we ever get back to uh, doing trade shows, uh, pretty much every single booth would have a printer and every company is selling their own brand of resins. So we're at the point where milling was 10 to 15 years ago, and it's kind of interesting to see and observe the parallels that are happening there. With printing, many of the limitations of subtractive manufacturing are solved. You no longer have to consider your tool geometry and undercuts are no longer a problem. That's not to say that printing is superior to milling. It has its own drawbacks as well. You do need to support your prints appropriately for them to print successfully. And your print sizes are instead limited by the actual physical limitations of your specific printer. Finally, 3D printing doesn't scale very well. So it's not the most cost-effective production method. In certain industries that employ mass manufacturing, once you get past the 100 unit mark and economies of scale start to kick in, uh, the cost per unit of 3D printed parts don't go down very much when compared to more profitable methods like injection molding or CNC machining. The exception, of course, comes when dealing with mass customized devices. Things like hearing aids and, of course, anything and everything in dentistry, uh, 3D printing excels when it comes to mass customization. That's why dentistry and 3D printing go hand in hand. So let's get acquainted with some of the basic terms and concepts that we normally use in 3D printing. I've been using the word dimension a lot in the past few slides, so let's discuss this term. What we're talking about when we say dimension is we're referring to an object's length, width, and height. A drawing on a paper has two dimensions, length and width, but it essentially has no depth or height. A 3D printed object has a length, a width, and height, and it's three-dimensional. And these dimensions are represented in virtual space by the letters X, Y, and Z. And I've prepared this simple animation uh, demonstrating the three axes and how they relate uh, to a 3D object, in this case, a dental model. Uh, the Z axis refers to the height or depth of the model, the X axis, its length, and the Y axis, its width. I know you must feel like you're back in 10th grade geometry, bored out of your mind, but we have to ask, why are dimensions important, important to us in dental 3D printing? Well, let's forget about 10th grade geometry for a moment and go back to elementary school art class instead. And let's look at tracing paper and connect the dots. I'm sure a lot of you have used one of these at some point in your life, or if not, you have kids and they're using it. Well, how does this relate to 3D printing? If we go back to our XYZ three shape model here, every single point on this model has a coordinate. For example, let me get my uh, laser pointer out here real quick. For example, this point here on the cusp of Carabelli uh, may have an X value of 52, a Y value of 49, and a Z value of 32. And um, this buccal cusp here on the third molar may have a coordinate of x negative 128, y negative 256, and a z of negative 512. Uh, but the idea is that every single point, no matter where it is on this model, has a specific coordinate in 3D space. 
So the software interprets this data and it goes through piece, slice by slice and it determines uh, and figures out what each of these coordinates are. So exactly like our friend uh, Pikachu over here, whose ear, whose left ear uh, consists of numbers 44 through 53, the software will slice through each of those layers of a 3D object and tell our printer where it should be connecting and where those dots are tracing. And this software is quite conveniently called a slicer. So you can import your 3D files in, add supports for printing, and then nest them onto a virtual build platform. Once you've done all that, the software translates that information into individual layers or slices and sends it to a 3D printer in a language that it understands called G-code. But before we get ahead of ourselves, let's discuss a little bit more about uh, some of the concepts we just introduced here, like 3D file formats, generating supports, and the build platform. So for file formats, uh, the most common one you'll find in dental 3D printing is the STL file. In a nutshell, an STL file stores information about 3D models. The objects are made up of thousands or even millions of tiny little triangles called facets. The slicing software analyzes the coordinate data of each facet to determine what each individual layer will look like. The STL file format has been adopted and supported as the de facto 3D printing standard for the dental industry and the printing industry as a whole. Now, moving on to supports, uh, they are a type of removable scaffolding that helps to ensure a successful print. Once you are finished printing, you would normally remove the supports from your 3D printed part. When generating supports, flow needs to be considered. So what I'm referring to when I say flow is, uh, you need to imagine how the part being, is being supported from one layer to the next. If a part is simply floating in midair without any contact with the build plate, that area is likely to result in print failure. Accounting for things like overhang and unsupported areas is absolutely critical for ensuring a successful print. So that's easy, you say. Uh, what if I just load up uh, with a bunch of extra supports so we don't get any failures? That will work, of course, but um, we also need to strike a balance between how many supports we actually need, because too many supports will affect the final surface finish of your 3D printed part. If your supports are too dense, you could be wa wasting excess resin, which could get expensive in the long run. It also requires more time to manually finish and smooth the rough surfaces left by the supports. So definitely something to keep in mind is to try and find a happy medium when generating supports. And the build platform is where all your 3D printed parts will attach to during the printing process. The build platform in most 3D printers will move up or down as each consecutive layer is printed. Depending on the printing technology, the size of the build platform can vary quite a bit. Because of this, if your build platform is too small, it could really limit the productivity and capacity of a given printer. Something very important to consider when shopping for a printer. Usually, when the build platform acts as the build platform acts as a the Z axis and moves up or down as each layer is printed. Uh, the technologies and how this is achieved can vary quite a bit, and they all have advantages and disadvantages when compared to one another. So let's discuss that a little bit now. The three main types of materials that you can print with can be broadly classified into three categories, uh, filament, resin, and powder. The technologies you use to print them are FDM, um, so like a filament, uh, photopolymerization or resins, and then finally uh, laser melting. So FDM or FFF sometimes you'll see stands for fused deposition modeling or fused filament fabrication. Uh, they're identical, the technologies are identical, um, the terminology difference is only down to a trademark dispute pretty much. Um, so yes, FDM, FFF are the same. And this is what you'll find in your hobbyist type printers where you have a plastic filament and it gets heated up and deposited into the desired shapes. So very limited use in dental 3D printing specifically, but it's currently the only way that you can print Valplast actually. So that's FDM for you. Traditional SLA uses a single laser and some mirrors mounted on motors that rotate and draw everything out. It's a very slow process because the printer is essentially drawing everything out on each layer. DLP 
is a projector that does the exposing rather than the laser in contrast to SLA. So for, in, for example, SLA would be like drawing something out with a pencil, whereas DLP could be likened to if you had a stamp and projected an entire image onto the build platform all at once. So remember how we mentioned in the previous slide about build platform size being limited by the printing technology? Well, typically what you'll find is that DLP build platforms are much smaller than their SLA counterparts. And the reason for that is because lasers can ma maintain a better fidelity over longer distances because they're essentially a single point. DLP, on the other hand, because it is a projected image, the further out you project an image, the fuzzier it tends to get at the edges. So in order to counteract this drawback, DLP printer manufacturers typically keep their build platforms relatively small uh, in comparison to SLA in order to maintain a higher resolution and accuracy. The next technology uh, it would be jetting. Uh, so jetting also uses resin, but the way that it's employed is very much like a desktop jet printer um, where resin is injected through nozzles. Uh, this is a very neat technology because it allows for variable materials in one single print. So you could jet multiple colors or multiple different types of materials. So your solids could be one thing and then you could jet your supports in something that's easily dissolvable by alcohol. Um, which then kind of eliminates your surface finish issues um, if you were printing with regular supports. And then finally, uh, we have SLM or powder fusion, uh, also called laser melting. You essentially have a powdered metal and a laser, very much like SLA, and it melts or sinters the powdered metal together to produce metal parts. And typically you'll find these machines in large outsourcing facilities. An excellent way to uh, still offer metal restorations if you're anything like me and absolutely terrified of casting PFMs using an acetylene torch and a broken arm casting machine. So of course the two most popular technologies are SLA and DLP. Uh, so here are a couple of videos illustrating how those two technologies work. So all of the VAT photopolymer resin-based printing technologies are a form of stereolithography. Um, although manufacturers and companies will tell you that these technologies are extremely different and one may be better than the other, they are at their core all based on the original stereolithography process that was in invented in 1983 by Chuck Hall. They all use a source of light and cure a photosensitive resin in order to produce a 3D object. Single laser SLA is self-explanatory, DLP uh, instead uses a projector, MSLA uses either LEDs or LCDs as the light source, and in the end they all produce a three-dimensional object. Now let's talk about the basic parts of a VAT photopolymer 3D printer. No matter if you have a laser SLA, DLP, LCD, or a non-contact DLP printer, these are the basic building blocks that make up a resin printer. You have your UV protective cover, uh, something to filter out the UV light so that the resin doesn't accidentally cure. Uh, these are our pho photosensitive materials that we're working with. So overhead lights, natural daylight, anything that emits UV radiation will cure your resin. The next thing you'll need is a light source or light engine. So either a laser or a projector usually. Uh, then you have your build platform, which we had discussed previously, and this is where all your parts would adhere to. And finally, you have your resin vat. It can also be called the build tray, a resin tank, a reservoir tank, a resin tray, etc., etc. 
The resin vat is a container with an optically clear bottom and it holds a certain volume of resin so that your build platform can raise in and out of it. The bottom of the resin vat on traditional DLP printers consists of a flexible membrane. Uh, the reason for this is the resin is partially cured uh, during the exposure and the flexible membrane um, is then it's peeled off of that flexible membrane by the build platform. Because this membrane experiences a lot of wear and tear as a result of literal tearing of the 3D printed parts off of it, uh, the resin vat in most printers is considered a consumable item and it needs to be replaced pretty regularly once it's reached the end of its life expectancy. Some printers like Asiga uh, have built-in sensors that will track how many builds and how much resin volume has been processed by your resin tray and will automatically notify you that it's time to replace your resin tray soon. You can typically choose to ignore this, but be forewarned that if it does fail, you can have resin leak all over your optical window or even worse, cause damage to your actual light source or other internal printer components. I've also included an animation that demonstrates the peeling process that we just described. So of course, we also need to mention a technology called non-contact DLP. Uh, the most popular, of course, is CLIP from Carbon. Uh, Non-contact DLP is essentially this uh, modified DLP process. In traditional SLA and DLP systems, the layers are glued onto the resin tank and need to be peeled off of the base. Whereas non-contact DLP has the print suspended in the middle of the resin and it's pulled out of the vat, uh, which reduces shearing forces, decreases print times, and potentially leads to more accurate prints due to less distortion. I've prepared this handy little chart that has some of the most popular 3D printers at different price points that we use in dentistry today. Uh, you can see the rough price points and printing technology that we've just discussed. I've also included some specs on here to help build, pla like, uh, build platform size, wavelength, and XY accuracy. So typically, when it comes to uh, the sales pitch, you hear about wavelengths, 385 does this, 405 does that, et cetera, et cetera. But if we look at actual physical wavelengths, what we are actually describing is the distance between the waves. Longer wavelengths carry less energy and shorter waves carry more energy and result in faster, deeper cures. 385 achieves more detail because the waves are physically smaller and the range of reactivity is much narrower than visible light at 405, which can scatter and from a range of 400 to 410, resulting in overexposure. 405 nanometer light, nanometer light engines are also more cost effective and easier to source. So it makes them a little bit more budget friendly. So as a result, you might say, hey, you know, this guy here that's presenting, had, I see this Form Labs here, it has a relatively large build platform. It's super cheap. And this guy's telling me that SLA and DLP are essentially the same. So why should I spend more and buy something that's four or five times the price? Well, truth be told, um, you should be looking at the XY accuracy, and that's why I included it in this presentation. Uh, so the, remember all that dimension talk we were mentioning earlier? XY resolution is a true indicator of accuracy. So don't look at the Z depth of a printer when shopping around, because Z depth is essentially meaningless uh, for accuracy. You can achieve better surface finish by decreasing your Z depth from 100 microns down to, let's say, 25 microns. But it it doesn't make your prints any more accurate. Uh, the reason for this is because you think, okay, well, lasers are a point, but remember, we are sourcing much cheaper light engines for uh, something, let's say, for the form labs. And so if you point something perpendicular to wall at a 90 degree angle, it's a perfect circle, right? But if you're pointing at like a 45 degree angle or some very steep angles, that circle then starts to become elliptical. And it also loses fidelity over long distances. So something like the Form Labs, it's a fantastic hobbyist printer. Um, it, it's, it revolutionized the, the SLA uh, segment, and that's why it's so popular. But for, for dental, you do really need something that is much, much more accurate. And finally, you'll also see on this chart that we are mentioning open and closed systems. Um, so what, what we mean there is a closed system 
is exactly like where companies are copying the traditional printer business model of selling you the printer at a loss in hopes of recouping that loss later by overpricing the ink. Again, finding parallels from our past mistakes, my first milling system, we had this RFID barcode reader that you had to scan the disks in. And if you didn't have a barcode, you couldn't mill it. Nowadays, uh, you can go out, buy any zirconia blank that you want to buy and then mill it on pretty much any machine that you want so long as it adheres to that 98 millimeter standard. And the trend that I'm seeing with printing is fortunately the same. Open systems allow you to use pretty much any resin with any printer so long as there's a material profile for it. And even if there isn't a configuration file, if you're savvy enough and you understand how to calculate uh, milliwatts per cubic centimeter, you can create your own profiles by applying the appropriate settings to your printer. So an open versus closed system should be a big designing factor for you when choosing a printer. Now that you're all experts in 3D printer construction and technology, let's move on to the fun stuff and find out what we can actually produce with your 3D printers. So first up is castable applications. Uh, when, uh, when you produce something like a, a pattern for pressing or casting, so things like veneers, metal copings, RPD frameworks, if you're anything like me and just a mediocre technician when it comes to using your actual hands, but you're extremely comfortable with a mouse and keyboard, I'd much rather design a veneer or full crown using a computer and then have it printed so you can achieve more intimate fit uh, compared to, let's say, milling. If you're milling wax, um, especially in those sharp incisal edges where they're usually, um, you need to put burr compensation. So printing, for especially for things like veneers where you need better fits, uh, definitely an excellent option. Models, of course, are currently the most popular use for printing in our lab. Of course, crown and bridge models with a removable die accounts for about 90% of our 3D printing currently. But pretty much any type of model that you can pour up in gypsum can be 3D printed. So digital implant models with pink gingival masks, diagnostic models, removable models for suck down thermoforms. Um, I find that most traditional models for removables are actually poured using alginate or other uh, cheap inaccurate impression materials. 3D printed models are equally accurate across the board, whether it's for crowns or for an Essex splint. So fabricating, the, so the feedback from dentists has been very positive on the improved fit of their uh, removable restorations specifically. And then of course we have splints and night guards. Uh, they're an excellent growth opportunity uh, that 3D printing can introduce to your lab. So one of my favorite materials is Key Splint Soft. It's a flexible splint material that's been absolutely wonderful. And the feedback I've gotten from the clinical side has been fantastic. You can print it as thin as one and a half millimeters and it it's, has like a, a memory effect. So once you warm it up a little bit, it does have a little bit of flexibility. So it's super durable, excellent stuff. Surgical guides are another popular use for 3D printing. Uh, guided implant surgery makes things so simple and predictable for placing implants. So typically, if I'm doing like an immediate load, load case, we will perform a virtual tooth extraction, uh, design a temporary crown to fit over a temp cylinder and produce the surgical guide with the corresponding sleeves. So I absolutely love this workflow because the implants are designed from the top down rather than the bottom up. So you have perfect screw hole access, either lingually on the anteriors or centrally on the occlusal surface right in the middle dead center for posterior crowns. And you have a perfectly sculpted emergence profile for the final restoration as well. Of course, the most popular application for digitally printed models in the world by far is for the fabrication of clear aligners. Too far, sorry about that. Okay, so for the fabrication of clear aligners. Uh, and a lot of the pioneering in dental 3D printing can be credited to one company and that's Invisalign. Uh, they were the first company to really go out there and use this technology on a mass scale. When they first started in 1997, they would work on traditional stone models and segment the teeth, move the teeth slightly and then duplicate the models. And then they'd segment the teeth again move them a little bit more, duplicate the models, and go on and on and on and on. And on average for each case, Invisalign produces uh, about 40 models per patient for comprehensive orthodontic treatment. 
So you can imagine the scope and magnitude of models that Invisalign needs to produce. And to this day, they are by a wide margin, the largest producer of 3D printed parts. So not just in dental, but the largest general producer of 3D printed parts in the whole world. And they're printing an average of about 325,000 models per day. So just imagine the scale of, of how, ma how massive amount of models that is. And then, of course, we have um, indirect bonding trays uh, going fo following up with ortho. Indirect bonding trays are another amazing way that um, 3D printing can improve efficiency. So depending on your jurisdiction and the laws governing orthodontics, if you're an orthodontist and you're legally required to be the one that places the brackets on the patient, rather than just taking an hour, you can do it in essentially 30 seconds. And the same goes for ortho labs that are currently servicing these orthodontists and fabricating these indirect bonding trays using traditional methods. So rather than sitting there at your bench, marking up the model, figuring out the ideal centric position for the tooth, duplicating the models, and this process could take up to four hours. You can let the computer do the hard work of planning the bracket placement, sit back while your printer prints it out in about less than 30 minutes. And finally, the hottest topic in dental technology today, of course, is digital dentures. 3D printed digital dentures are going to completely revolutionize the way we will be making dentures going forward. Development on the software hardware side, along with the materials, has reached a point of mass market adoption. 3D printing dentures is more efficient, more consistent, and it's a scalable process. For example, a proficient denture technician would typically set aside about two and a half hours to complete a denture setup. And if they need to reset the denture teeth, it can take anywhere between a half an hour to 45 minutes. With digital design in a program like 3Shape, this process of resetting teeth takes no more than 10, 15 minutes maximum. These teeth are already programmed in perfect bilateral balance seclusion. So pretty much it's essentially a click of a button. Then of course you send it to your printer, you can send it and do a monoblock try-in while you're setting up another denture. Once you've printed out your parts, you still need to clean and post-process them. So let's discuss that a little bit now. Parts should be or higher purity. I use 99% for pretty much everything. Uh, sourcing that nowadays may be a little bit of an issue, but uh, we'll see once we get back to uh, whatever our new normal is. Uh, your first stage is a dirty bath for removing large amounts of resin, and your second stage is a clean bath to ensure that your part is as clean as possible prior to curing. My dirty bath that I use is a Form Labs form wash with an agitator. Uh, it's an excellent cleaning unit that holds a large volume of alcohol and has some automated features. The clean bath is a small jewelry ultrasonic unit. Uh, so what I do is I'll wash in each bath two to three minutes um, in the dirty bath, two to three minutes in the clean bath, depending on what the material specifications and the instructions for use are. And typically you try not to exceed more than four to six minutes of total washing time because the alcohol will begin to degrade your prints over an extended period of time, which could affect accuracy. Denatured alcohol and ethanol is sometimes easier to find and is cheaper. Uh, these forms of alcohol infiltrate and affect the chemical properties and strength and accuracy of the, the parts. I've also heard the use of TPM, which stands for tripropylene glycol monomethyl ether, um, which is something else you could use for washing, but I haven't heard anything from a manufacturer. And I, I typically like to wait until you have official uh, recommendations before using it. So uh, once again, these chemicals infiltrate and they affect the chemical properties and strength of your prints, uh, which can result in reduced strength or an incomplete cure. And bearing in mind that you need to be fully cured for some of these materials to be considered biocompatible, you wanna really tread lightly in compromising the integrity of a material when using other forms of alcohol besides IPA. Uh, once you've completed your washing process, you need to dry off the excess moisture with the compressed air. Uh, inspect the model for any glossy areas of residual resin. Uh, if any area appears shiny, then simply repeat the washing process as needed. Uh, to cure, I highly recommend using the AutoFlash G171 with uh, grade five or 99.999% pure nitrogen. So moving on to curing, once again, I may start sounding like a broken record, but for biocompatible materials, 
like denture bases and splints, post curing is extremely important. I'm the biggest proponent of finding the cheapest option that will get the job done. Uh, Forum Labs actually has an official guide on their website for using a manicurist UV light box with some aluminum foil to cure your prints. Um, but because the materials are biocompatible and all the hassle that was required to get that through Health Canada approval or FDA, whatever it may be, you may want to make sure that any residual monomer or binders or additives are completely removed and that everything is 100% fully cured to eliminate the possibility of any cytotoxicity or adverse effects in the patients because they are wearing these appliances long term. So depending on your curing system, uh, some use a glycerol bath for the inert curing environment instead of a nitrogen, but the overall technique is the same. So what you want to do is you want to place your models flat side down or the part with the most surface area to help prevent warping. 2,000 flashes per side, so you take it, flip it around, specifically in the G171, your uh, curing unit may have a different um, process. Of course, I use, at, at minimum, they recommend grade 2.6 or 99.6 for optimal results, but I use grade five or 99.999% pure nitrogen. If you don't have nitrogen or you run out, try not to flash consecutively, wait a few minutes for the material to cool down and prevent overheating or shrinking or warping. Uh, the fit and finish of your prints will be significantly affected without an uh, oxygen inert environment. So try to keep as much nitrogen or glycerol on hand as you can. And then finally, of course, you want to wait for your parts to cool completely prior to removing them from the curing unit to prevent thermal shock and warping. And finally, uh, you can pretty much finish your 3D printed parts in the exact same manner you would a traditionally processed restoration. Uh, you can grind, fit, polish it using typically acrylic burrs or some wheels, uh, whatever you would normally use. And there's some manual adjustments that may ne be needed to relieve some undercuts but everything usually goes down pretty quick if you designed it correctly. Maybe a minute or two are, is, is what I use at most, and that's including like removing supports and adjusting. So you shouldn't need to play with your prints much. And finally, I'd fit check and refine the contacts, for example, on a denture or on a splint, and uh, finally pumice, pumice and polish as needed. Uh, so finally, I just want, you, want to leave you with a few things, like uh, tips and tricks uh, before we wrap up and move on to Q&A. So some limitations, of course, uh, with 3D printing and added, added manufacturing. Uh, a lot of the limitations of milling have been solved, but not all of them. So resins are still in the very early stages of development. Uh, 3D printed materials are not nearly as durable or strong as the restorations that have been milled. And finally, aesthetics and accuracy still have room to grow. Uh, 3D printed and even or even milled denture teeth still can't compare to, like a, let's say, a six-layer cross-linked denture tooth. Uh, with printers like, let's say, the Asiga, you have accurate enough prints to finally, but um, and at an attractive price point, so it, it can only get better from here. So moving on to some tips and tricks. For certain resins, it's recommended that you mix them one hour prior to printing. So agitating and shaking up the material really well and setting it aside for an hour so that we can allow for bubbles to rise and ensure a good resin consistency. So you have a very nice, clean, and clear print. Uh, this isn't for all resins, so make sure you check the instructions for use of your specific resins. Um, but if you do pour it out, at, like for example, key, key Splint Soft, and you notice uh, that there's some bubbles in the resin tray, just take a little clean instrument, pop those little bubbles to ensure that you're getting a nice homogenous print. Uh, keeping the build tray relatively full of resin while printing will help maintain pressure and tension on the membrane. Uh, which results in an increased likelihood of a successful print. So if you're getting print failures, sometimes it, it may just be because your, your resin level is actually too low. And also, don't leave your printed parts in a printer for more than eight hours. Uh, even though it has a UV protective cover, any stray UV light, it doesn't filter out all UV. So any stray UV light could cause undesired curing. If you're leaving the printer overnight, I mean, there's no light, so turn off the lights inside the lab, and that should help as well and extend that time a little bit. As for nesting and orienting uh, your 3D printed parts, uh, you'll have that will significantly affect your print times. So it's especially noticeable for laser SLA printers because the prints are happening one layer at a time being drawn, like I said, uh, like, a pen, like a pencil. So if you place an object vertically, that increases the layer count eventually when compared to a horizontal orientation. 
what I typically do is I'll run a batch of small jobs all throughout the day, printing horizontally or flat to the build platform as much as I can, and then doing a large vertical print job over for overnight builds. Uh, for digital implant models, what, we'll do, what I recommend is inserting the digital analog into the model before curing. And the same goes for surgical guides. Uh, make sure that you're inserting the sleeves before post-curing. Um, there is a little bit of uh, shrinkage, so it might uh, make it too tight where that analog won't be able to fit in. So with that, um, I think we can move on to the Q&A session. That concludes our presentation. So um, let me try and get my, my screen back on here. Hey, how's it going? Good. So a little, a little elaboration on the dentology, essentially uh, buying non-implant prosthetics from a company called Abutment Direct. It was kind of weird, obviously. 50% um, of our sales are actually non-implant related products. We're actually the largest 3D printer seller in Canada now of any de uh, dental company. Um, so we wanted a new brand, new name to bring all these non-implant prosthetic products under. And so we created a name, uh, Dentology. So Dentology has three printers, Almond Gerbach, Zirconia, and uh, different um, um, machinery. Um, Keystone, uh, full line of Keystone products, including the Proform, um, um, guards, um, milling tools, alloy, um, DTAX, uh, has a bunch of, of products, uh, like the Molosil and, um, all the different resins like, uh, Keystone, Soft Splints and DTAX, Asiga, Procedure. So we've basically taken all these products and put them on this in a, in a new catalog. The new catalog will be available probably in three weeks. Uh, basically, when everyone's getting back to work, we'll have a new catalog for everyone to make things easier. The prices will be in the catalog. It'll also include carbides, diamonds, polishers, um, all kinds of different products. Uh, it's about a hundred page catalog. So yeah, so we basically have, it's one company still, but two different brands. Some of the questions any here. New, any new exciting for stuff the, or if you want some CE credits, just email Mike at abutmentdirect.com and, uh, and I'll respond with a certificate with the name, okay? Some people want them, some people don't. Great. Okay, so I'll do it. And it looks like we have a question here from Stephen Reed. Um, Stephen, Stephen, Stephen? Um, so he says, hi, I have a Form 2 and a Moonray S printing N95 and 99 masks. Any recommendations on the best resins to use for this? Uh, you know what, for that, I'd say just use the cheapest possible resin that you could possibly find, um, but just something that doesn't smell toxic. <laughs> we really don't know, right? We're kind of in uncharted territory there, um, but you know, some, something that doesn't off gas too much stuff that you're breathing all day long, because because your, your breathing is already restricted with an N95. So, and then, uh, <laughs> <laughs> this this one here is from uh, a dentist friend of mine. Um, he's just teasing me, but uh, he says, "How did you learn so much?" He's he's my guinea pig. So whenever we were testing out like the key key split soft or anything like that, I said, "Hey, I got this new material. I need you to." I'll, I'll. So what we do? To, actually, this is a, a great little segue. So what we do is, if you want to try and get a new material and you're kind of scared, um, we would do like a regular thermoflex. So I'd fabricate a regular thermoflex and I'd print one as well. So it costs you a little bit more upfront, but what you do then is you say, Hey, you know what? I'm sending you to try it out, try the thermoflex and try out the, the key split. Okay. And let me know what you think, what, which one the, the patient likes and keep it. So you are making, doing double the work essentially, but that way, at least you get a little bit of feedback. You can, and you can kind of get your feet wet with it. I think it's really important when you, when you have a 3d printer that can print the thermoplastic night guards with the keystone uh, soft splint, immediately print a bunch of them, a bunch of samples and give them out to all your dentists. So the dentist can see what they look like. <clears throat> it doesn't ha necessarily have to go in someone's mouth right away, but that, you know, dentists want to touch the night guard, see what it looks like, see how it feels, run it under hot water. Um, when they get that experience and, and see the result, then they are, they're more likely to say, Hey, you know, on my next case, instead of the, 
uh, impact guard, make me a, a printed guard. Let's try it out on a patient. So, you know, it costs the, the cost to print a night guard is so, so low that it's not going to break the bank. And it's a great way to educate your dentist on what products are available um, and, and what the actual product looks like. So I'd recommend a lot of labs do that and their night guard sales go through the roof. Um, some labs don't do a lot of night guards. They might be doing a dentist crown and bridge, but the dentist is sending their night guards to somebody else. Well, this is a great way to get that cost, get that dentist to send you their night guards by offering a superior product. Um, so there's, there's different ways to do it, but I'd recommend printing a bunch of samples and sending them out to, to all your dentists. Absolutely. Yeah. And of course, if, if you don't know how to, I, I, I'm a shameless plug here, but if you don't know how to do any of these things, we do offer some fantastic courses all throughout the year on how to do night guards, um, how to do digital dentures, models, different things like that. So get in touch with the team at Dentology in order to um, sign up for those courses. Yeah, a 3D, a 3D printer is pretty useless if you don't know how to use it properly. So we do monthly webinars with men teaching you how to design night guards, how to design denture bases and temp teeth, how to even build models. Um, so if you are lacking those, those skills, um, get in touch with us and we'll let you know the next date for the, for the webinar you're looking for. Um, and essentially take your 3D printer and use it fully and, 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 and get your money's worth because um, they're not cheap. Um, you're looking at with the printer and the curing unit with the, with the auto flash curing unit with nitrogen, you're looking at after tax about $20,000. So it's not, it's not a, a, a you know, a thousand dollar piece of equipment you put in the corner and hope, hope you use it. If you're going to invest that much money, you want to use it. So we're here to make sure that you actually use it and are trained how to use it. Um, I don't think a lot of companies do that. So that's kind of how we've separated ourselves from the pack and uh, through, through service and training. All righty. Well, I think we've pretty much answered all the questions. If anybody wants to drop another question in there, we'll, we can, <laughs> but other than that, I think hopefully, hopefully you guys learned something good today. Yeah. You know what? I think, I think we'll do another free webinar in, in probably two weeks, three weeks, just to go over a little more detail on the Asiga and, and showing how to nest and, and showing how printing, um, you know, designing different prints, um, kind of a more advanced course. This course was more introductory to 3D printing, and the next one will be kind of level two. Um, this is what you can do with a 3D printer, specifically uh, more of a three-shape design and uh, um, type course. So stay tuned for that. Um, it'll be another one-hour free webinar just to give you guys some more um, more free advice and skills to work with um so yeah stay tuned okay. men will be the one doing it men i didn't yeah. tell you you're doing it but <laughs> i guess i'm doing it now so if you guys enjoyed <laughs> this one you'll you get to see me again yeah so uh, i do have another question it. from uh, rick asking about the form 3b on my thoughts about it so i don't have i have experience with the form labs form 2 and um if you've seen any of our past um webinars i'm my testimonial regarding it and not because it's sponsored by Asiga, but because my personal experience with Form Labs has not been very good. And from the anecdotal evidence I've heard online is that the Form 3B is actually slower than the Form 2 uh, somehow. Um, so not very promising. I mean, they, they did put a little bit of hype on it when they first started releasing it, but I, if it was going to be the next hot printer, you, you would definitely hear about it. There's a reason why the Asiga is the most popular selling printer in, in all of Canada. It, because I, think if you have, I think if you have the time, to fiddle with a 3D printer and you only print, you know, five pieces a week or five pieces a month, then getting a, a three, four thousand dollar printer makes sense. It gets you in the game, gets your feet wet, gets you some experience with 3D printing. If you're printing a decent amount of night guards and models, <clears throat> surgical guides, dentures, if you get a low cost cost printer, the amount of time you're going to waste on fixing it and figuring it out and reprinting misprints I mean, your time is worth money so you know you, you sure you might go from four or five grand to 20 grand but over the next five years the time you've wasted what is your time worth 
if your time is worth even $20 an hour, you're going to get that difference in the next five years. So if you do have a decent volume where you're printing 10 plus pieces a month, um, I think the Asiga is the way to go. It's by far the best printer under $40,000. Um, there is the Asiga Pro coming out that was just launched. We're getting a bunch in. We have a nine coming in. I think five or six of them are, are pre-sold. So we do have a few left. Um, those are more the $33,000 price point. Um, so those are your production labs uh, that are doing, say, 30, 40 uh, night guards in a week, um, you know, 30, 40 models in a week, um, where the max is going to be work, work to, the, to the bone and um, the pro is kind of going to come in. It's got three times the build plate size and it's actually more precise. It's gone from the max is 63 microns. And we're going, you're going to minimize it down to 56 microns. So it's actually more precise with the larger build plate. Fantastic. And I'm first on that list, right? Yeah. Yeah. We've got three, we got three shipping uh, next week and you, you got one of those, but then we have another three coming two weeks after that. And then the final three, about three weeks after that. So we have a steady stream of them coming in. Great. All righty. Well, with that, I think uh, we've, used up our entire hour. So thank you everyone once again for joining us today. Okay. Take care guys. All righty.